how many of you have any idea who we are, like from Dynatrace as a company? This, I promise this won't be a marketing pitch. We'll do our best to keep this more about a topical thing rather than uh, a product thing. Um, how many of you guys traveled in from uh, out of town, or how many of you locals? So a handful of you guys from out of town. Where are you, where are you from? You're local, OK. Out of town, where? Minnesota, nice. Norway, Norway. Uh, I think he wins right now. He's the furthest. Where are you from? Switzerland, oh, pretty close. Oh, see, he wins. That's it, Australia. That's completely the other side of the planet. He's the winner. He's the winner and the winner. How you doing? Ah. We may alternate. <laughs> okay, so it's just the podium? Gotcha. All right. So I will just move in. Just lean your head in. All right. Lean in. Um, all right. So uh, I guess we're uh, pretty much there. Uh, they're still checking some folks in, so I'll just give it another minute. But all right, so, so you came in from Australia, huh? It's pretty far away. How, how long was the flight? a long time on a plane. I flew six hours, and that was too much. It's too much. Um, excellent. So uh, my goal here, or our goal, Jurgen and I, our, uh, our goal is to not um, waste your time. Uh, we really want to provide you, hopefully, information that will take you through the next few days and asking the right questions. So we'll, we'll definitely kind of get into that. Um, but. Uh, I guess we're uh, ready to begin. Uh, is, is there any start signal for the for, for recording, or we just start? Okay. I guess yeah. we go. We go. Oh, yeah. All right. So, how you doing, everybody? Uh, my name is Peter Hack. I'm a, uh, a technical advocate for Dynatrace. Uh, Dynatrace is a, a monitoring solution, um, but uh, we're going to be talking today about Day Two Guide to Successful Management of Applications and OpenShift. Uh, together with my uh, my colleague here, Jürgen, Jürgen yeah. Etzelstorfer. Hi, I'm Jürgen. I came all the way from Austria, so also a long way, not not a, not as long as Australia. Don't confuse these these two countries. Uh, so uh, I'm a technology strategist at Dynatrace, and yeah, together with Peter, we will tell you something about uh, managing, hopefully successfully managing, OpenShift. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's get started here. So. Of course, this has to work. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. So we are not going to talk about these topics. <laughs> these are day one and day zero topics. And if you're here to hear about these specific topics, um, the, each of them in themselves is an entire session. And the other problem with it is um, they're really, if you're here to learn about day two and you didn't already do these, then you're pretty much stuck. You're screwed. You're going to have to start over. So, um, so really, we're, we're really not going to talk about configuration and design because that's actually something that you should have that should have been a planning stage. Routing and network considerations. You know, are you using Istio or Envoy or are you using Ingress controllers? Things like that. Are, those are already decisions that were made. Um, repositories, registries. Um, you know, how are you are you using K or using whatever? Those again, all of these topics are really bigger picture topics that should have been addressed before this. What we're really going to talk about today is the journey, right? So the journey in kind of simple context is you, you now as operators of an OpenShift platform or developers of an OpenShift platform, um, you are part of this experience where you're, you bought an airplane, right? You bought this really big monstrosity. Uh, of a platform, <laughs> and uh, and you're going to see problems. You're going to have issues, um, and really the the most important thing, the reason you have these technologies, these platform type technologies in your environment, is really about your customers, right? The customers at the endpoint that are that are providing revenue to your organizations. Your goal is to provide agility, to get give your developers the ability to get these 
applications out faster to get them out and be reliable, right? So that they're running and they're up and they're available. So we're going to talk a lot about, you know, availability. Is it in the air, right? Or is it at the gate? If it's at the gate, you're losing money, right? Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about, you know, what's on the radar? What's in front of you? Do you, can, do you have the observability to see what's going on in the environment and be able to help you to predict or avoid problems? Do you kind of steer through uh, you know, the problem, or the storm, I should say, right? Or do you kind of figure a way to go around it and avoid the storm? And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about leveling up. So leveling up meaning, you know, getting to the next level. Now that you have this platform and you're operating it, the reality is these platforms are very complex, uh, and they require a high level of automation, and we're going to talk a little bit about that automation piece. So what do I mean when you bought a plane? Well, it's a platform, right? You, you bought... And, and the plane itself is really just one part of that platform, but you bought a platform uh, very much like an airplane. You, know, you bought a Boeing or you bought a, you know, or an Airbus, right? You, you have this platform, and on this platform, you, know, you provide these seats. These seats you could think of as your containers, right? The container, to, you know, the space on your, on your uh, platform for people to actually run and you know, be passengers and consumers of your platform. So I'm using this analogy. You'll, you'll follow through this analogy a little bit, but it, it kind of works because when you think about how complex an aircraft is um, and, and how much you are in charge of scheduling where things are or, where, or the platform itself is being scheduled, whether things are going to run together, whether they're going to be separated, or they're going to run as a pod, for instance, they should all be kind of grouped together, things like that. So. Um, the idea of this platform is really uh, an important part of it because you're in charge of the care and feeding of your containers. Um, ultimately, the issue that you're going to run into is you, need to, you can't starve your containers or your applications that are running there of resources because if you do, you're going to have a horrible passenger experience or your customers are going to have a horrible experience. Ultimately, your applications are not going to have a good experience and in the end, um, you're to blame, right, because you didn't provide what you need. And lastly, it's going to have to scale, right? So you really, you're an airline. This platform is one piece of the puzzle. So how did we get here? That's really the, that's really the question. So what, it, what exactly is this microservice container platform? Um, well, you know, how many, of, how many of you guys are operators? How many of you are the operations side of the, of the house that are, that are building these platforms. Okay, so we've all kind of experienced this. Maybe, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we were building servers. We were putting operating systems on servers, we were managing those operating systems, and we were putting lots of servers up for lots of applications. And then all these new kind of virtualizations and abstractions kind of introduced themselves. So we have lots of servers running on these servers in this virtualization platform. And then on top of that, we introduced C groups, which, you know, Docker and others, and they've kind of grouped and, and grown uh, to provide these container based platforms for those microservices. And then we built things like Kubernetes so we could schedule across platforms, across data centers, across uh, various different server layers, uh, these microservices. They could be scheduled to run wherever they need to run. And the challenge, of course, when you look at this is now I don't know where they're running uh, and when they're running, and they're ephemeral. So we've got these very large abstractions being introduced into the environment. And then, of course, the cloud came along. So now we've got hybrid cloud microservice and container platforms where not only do I not know where these containers may be running, but if you're using things like Fargate and AWS or you're using um, you know, any of the container-based services, then those container platforms are running on hardware and infrastructure that you don't even own. But you're still can, you know, running this OpenShift platform, and this OpenShift platform might be scheduling things into you know, containers into these other places via APIs. So you have to be truly in underst you know, understand how this all works. And then finally, the concept of serverless and functions has been introduced, where now we're not even running the applications that the users are providing us. We're just providing them some slot for them to run their function, their code. They're literally just giving you code now. Um, it's not a being wrapped up by you in any way. It's it basically a piece of code that gets executed. And if you think about this, right, we've really come for full circle. Um, any idea what I mean when I say coming full circle? 
Exactly. Welcome to the 60s, right? We've literally gone from a server that's, centra you know, that's a centralized thing uh, all the way to you know, desktops, to cloud, to all the way back to a centralized component. But it's not really mainframe, because now it's really distributed computing, right? Even though I'm running these functions and I'm responsible for the, the performance and the accuracy and the, the, the availability of these functions, I'm also kind of responsible for the entire fleet of my airline, right? So I am now organizing and scheduling all of those resources to be available for all of the functions and services that I'm providing as an operator. So why did I go through all this? Why did we really talk about the abstraction and, and this airplane analogy? Well, I'm going to have Jurgen kind of explain because the evolution of microservices kind of determined that for us. Thanks. So, um, yeah, a couple of years ago, so first I have to say we borrowed this slide kind of from, from uh, Red Hat. But, um, and with this slide, I want to show you how the, the move of complexity, the shift of complexity, and the evolution of the microservices, uh, especially uh, regarding the complexity on the one hand and simplicity on the other hand. So a couple of years ago, uh, a lot of uh, complexity uh, when developing microservices was hidden or um, ha has to be uh, taken care of uh, in, in the business logic of the microservice itself since uh, the underlying platforms did not have the capabilities to. So with time, we uh, evolved into um, new services, new platforms, and uh, business logic in the microservices itself. The kind of are, are now more focused on, uh, on the logic itself without um, taking care of other things like uh, tracing, uh, like load balancing. This should not be in the, in the business logic of the services itself, but instead it moved to the platforms. And what we see is like today with OpenShift and Istio and, and these services, a lot of complexity actually moved into the platforms itself. So the simplicity the simplification uh, really means the simplification for, uh, for developing microservices. But since uh, yeah, Peter asked you, mo most of you, as I uh, recognized, are more on the operations side. So actually, this should not be simplification, but more maybe complexification or so something like this. Yeah. <laughs> complexity. <laughs> complexity, yeah. So, um, but what we see is there is this kind of shift between uh, the, the developers and the operations. And uh, you as operations guys, you have to take care that everything the developer uh, puts on your platform is really, um, or your platform is ready, that uh, applications really run on those platforms and the developer can focus on, on the business logics um, themselves, basically. Yeah, and what Jurgen really highlights very well in this slide, actually in Red Hat provided us the slide, so it's very helpful as well, is uh, as operations folks, you, while, the, while it got simpler for your developers, you now have that burden of the operation side. You have to run these platforms. And this is kind of why I've shown you a lot about the abstractions, right? There's a lot going on in the platform. There's a lot going on that you may or may not be aware of. And that's really what the, the focus of the topic is about, is about this observability story. Because there's a consequence when you add a lot of complexity. So this is, um, this was a, you know, this is, is a customer. This uh, is a slide they provide. Um, this was prior to, to being our customer, of course. Um, but they, how many of you run into this type of thing where you have a reoccurring issue that has taken months to resolve in platforms that you currently already understood, right? Maybe it's just VMware. Maybe it's, you know, just running some application on a host. Uh, you have these reoccurring issues that you can never seem to trace. And imagine now you have those types of problems that are happening, but they're happening in, a, in an environment where everything's ephemeral. Everything's moving and transient. That's going to create a lot of challenges for you to solve problems. And you could spend hundreds and hundreds of hours across all of your teams trying to solve this problem and actually never come to a resolution. I mean, what is, I don't know what your SLA is today or what your, you know, what your expected SLAs are and your MTTR, right, your mean time to resolution, but I would expect that 479 hours is probably exceeding that, right? 
So how do you, how do you avoid this? How do you avoid lot, losing a lot of time and a lot of money, right? Translation into capital, but also reputation. Brand reputation is a huge problem. If you get bad tweets because your application sucks, right? Your company is going to suffer, and the person who's going to take the hit is the operator who can't figure out what the problem is. So observability is a really big part of this, uh, this platform. You need to be able to see. So how many of you have environments that look like this, right? You've got lots of different application stacks. You guys, anyone? Yeah, a lot of hands, right? Uh, lots of different uh, platforms. Maybe you know today you're trying Kubernetes, tomorrow you're trying OpenShift. Maybe you have some Pivotal in there, right? Um, you definitely have a lot of operating systems. I mean, I'm sure you're at a Red Hat conference, so you have some Red Hat, but you also probably have Microsoft in there as well. And, uh, and you're probably using some cloud-based solutions as well as some on-prem data center type technologies like VMware. And you probably have some, some really old school stuff like AIX or Solaris hiding somewhere in your enterprise. When you have this kind of complexity, how long does it take you to find a problem? And this is where I want you to change your thinking from this MTTR, right, the mean time to resolution, that's what everybody's saying. Your SLA is, you know, you have to resolve this in 72 hours. Well, how much of that time is spent just discovering and analyzing that problem, right? When you're discovering a problem, it could be, you know, days, especially when you're looking at all of that complexity. So I'd like to introduce to you guys something else to think about. How about the mean time to discovery, right? How long does it take you to figure out a problem? Because it might be as simple to solve as restarting a service or rebooting a host or, you know, scaling up. But knowing what the problem is, is, is a big part of that. So think about that turbulence, right? Turbulence in flight is where you need to resolve issues. Now, this happens to be a, a part of the Dynatrace product as a demonstration here. But imagine that you have a, a real service up in the top there, this Nginx web service, and all of the types of alerts and problems that, it's, that are impacting that particular service when the root cause of it happens to be down at the very bottom and it just could be a memory issue on a host, right? The host it's running on. And being able to see those types of problems, have that type of observability is a very important part of an OpenShift platform because these services are running on top of other services, on top of virtualized machines, in data centers or in cloud, and you don't know where they are at all times and the logging may not be available and such. So really think about when you're looking at problems, right, how do I observe where that, where the root causes of these problems are? And when you think about it, this is, a, this is another kind of visualization from our solution, but really I do, I'm showing you this for a different reason. Um, imagine a complex environment. This is actually, this environment has over 10,000 uh, processes running in this environment. I mean, it's pretty complex, it looks pretty messy, but the reality is that within this environment, uh, you've got a lot of problems. You see all the little red dots in that. Those are all microservices or processes that are having issues. Um, and services-wise, you have quite a few issues. But here's the thing. If you're eating dinner with your family and you're on call and you get an alert that you have a problem in your environment, how important for you is it to know that your users aren't impacted? Yeah, I've got problems here, but if you notice that top layer there, right, we're just showing you that, you know, if, if you don't have user problems, if the users themselves aren't impacted, then you, you can finish dinner, right? Save your marriage, right? Don't, don't run out because suddenly you have a problem. So really, the, the observability I'm talking about here is that you need to understand where the problems are, and what the impact is for your business, right? Not, and that'll then become what we call humane DevOps, right? Eat dinner, survive. So let's talk a little bit about what's out there today, right? So we have, there's a lot of solutions out there. Dynatrace just is one of them. But the solutions that are out there today will tell you things like it's available, it's up, you are consuming resources. But just because you're consuming resources doesn't mean the product's available or your, your applications are available. It, I had a customer the other day who was explaining to me that um, using readiness probes, for instance, 
They're great. Liveness probes and readiness probes are great, except in his case, he had a fairly large JVM, a monolithic JVM that he was running in containers. And he's, he was running a readiness probe that was checking a URL, but the servlet in the JVM was available. So it said, sure, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. So it was, it was feeding the, the specific request that he had in the readiness probe. But the, but the problem was the JVM wasn't fully loaded, so nothing was, so he was still getting service failures and service errors. And that the reality was that the readiness probes weren't truly telling him that he was available. They were just saying that he was up, right? So it's important to know that all of the different metrics that you can gather about of, you know, uptime uh, are useless if your application's not available. So when you're measuring yourself, right, when you're measuring your, when your developers are measuring you, when, you're, when your company is measuring you, measure on availability. What's, is it alive? Is it actually working? Not, is it just up? And then when we talk about observability, um, that what's on your radar? How, are you, how, do you, how do you figure out what's going on? Right? There's lots of ways to do this. So um, I was at uh, a conference not long ago, and someone raised their hand and said, yeah, you know, monitoring. I don't, you know, monitoring adds, adds you know, overhead. And I don't want to add overhead to my application, because adding any kind of overhead is going to slow me down. And I said, OK. He said, so he was kind of referencing this idea of an observer effect. Well, let's, let's take, for example, this shiny airplane, right? We strip all of the instrumentation out. Just rip it out. We don't need it. I mean, who needs radar, right? Who cares? So we rip all the instrumentation out, and we have this brand new, shiny, lightweight, performant airplane that we watch as it flies and just goes to the ground. You can substitute the word you want to use. Um, so that's not, that's not really a good user experience, I imagine. Right? So that's not really an option. You have to monitor it some way. So as operations folks, what do we do? We, we do infrastructure. right? We'll monitor from infrastructure. We'll use the various components, solutions that are out there to tell me about CPU, memory, disk, network. And that's great. It's like, think about like remote control. Like I can see level flight. It's flying straight. It's going the vector that I want it to. But the reality is, what's going on inside? Maybe it's depressurized. Maybe everybody's you know, not experiencing a good flight. How, how would you know? You wouldn't, because the, all you see is the externals. You see the container resources being used. You see your. Uh, you know, your server resources. You, maybe you see your CloudWatch metrics, for instance. But that's not telling you what your applications or the services inside of them are doing. So it's important that you, you find a way to get that type of information. So how do you do that? Well, there's a couple of different options. Well, you could do synthetics, right? You can introduce the idea of, I'm going to use an external observer that's going to look at my applications and tell me, you know, if I do this transaction, does it work? And that's you know, no real impact on the application other than a few extra you know, calls to my resources. So really no impact. Synthetics is a good option. Um, you, call, you, you call it up. You say, how are you doing? The robot says, eh, I'm a little cramped for space, a little cold. But otherwise, everything's fine. But what if you chose the wrong transaction to, to test or to continually test? Maybe, maybe there's a different business transaction you need to know about. A better way to see that would be well, let's use real user sentiment. What does it look like when your users are doing this? And this is a little bit, slightly a little bit more overhead because now you're introducing JavaScript into your pages. Right? So you introduce this JavaScript into the pages, and now you get real user visibility. How are my users performing? Some guys are happy. Maybe the, the group over on the right is very happy. But the group on the left, well, one guy is not feeling so well, so the other guy's a little angry. Right? Maybe that's uh, what's going on. But Ultimately, that real user sentiment is a really important part of your observability matrix. So make sure that you kind of think about how do I get that, that information. And then there's agents. Now, this is where the overhead question comes into play. There's lots of different agents out there. They're, you know, they're different you know, qualities of them. They collect different levels of information. And it's important for you to understand the differences in those agents. So, when you implement agents, you're going to do things like profiling of an application, or you're going to be adding code in many cases to your applications. So keep in mind that 
when you are using agents, you're now you potentially are introducing overhead. So look for agent technologies that are going to not be uh, impactful and that are also going to provide value. Because the one thing that an agent really does is for that small amount of resource utilization, you're going to get a tremendous amount of value because you're going to know everything going on in that application what response times look like between services. You're going to see things like uh, timings of calls to your database queries. You're going to be able to look at all of the metrics within those specific services with agents. So don't discount them because they have overhead, but be, you know, be aware that you want to find agents that provide the best value and the most value if you're going to introduce that, that technology. And ultimately, then, you have this idea of a full stack view. If you have all of the pieces, if you have the infrastructure, the synthetics, the agents, the real user sentiment, you now have that full stack visibility. And that gives you that full matrix, the full picture of what's going on, the observability into your platform. And using all of these tools together with the full stack part of that, you're going to be able to see the infrastructure components of your OpenStack cluster if it's running on uh, if you're running OpenShift on top of that, the OpenShift components, the containers that are running there, the applications running inside of it, and ultimately the applications that are being, that are being served up to your users and what those users are experiencing. So this is a very, very important part of your day two journey is to understand that you have to have that visibility across the board. Any questions on this? Okay. Uh, all right, so this is where we talk about leveling up. So I've laid out the groundwork, you, right? Observability is important. Understanding that platform, understanding your mean time to discovery. But when it comes down to it, Kubernetes is just an API platform. It really is. It's built, OpenShift and Kubernetes are built around using APIs to drive agility. So how do you, how do you kind of start thinking in API terms, right? Um, first of all, you are not going to be able to manage this with dials. You're not going to be able to look at your, your OpenShift environment as an operator, especially at scale, and be able to manage it one container at a time, or one application service at a time. You're not going to be able to do it. So, so first, look into APIs. Start understanding and learning about APIs. If you're not familiar with it, get familiar with them, because Infrastructure as code is critical when you're talking about complex environments like OpenShift. So when you do that, I don't know if many of you are fans of XKCD. I assume you are. Um, when you do that, uh, think about this. You're, the idea is you're going to write an application or some sort of program script that's going to then free up all this time. Right? But if you look at the roots of automating, the root of auto is self, and the root of mating, if you use your imagination, there's another root, actually, but we're going we're gonna to use the one you're thinking of for the moment. It's you're self screwing your self-screwing. Right? If you write your own application scripts to try and manage these complex environments, you are screwing yourself, because you will spend an immense amount of time trying to support that forever. But if we use a different root, then it's helping, right? You want to self-help, right? So the idea here is use solutions like if you're going to use open APIs, you can communicate between components that exist, like you could do chatbots in Slack, or you could you know, communicate to an existing service like ServiceNow, or you can use Ansible for remediation, right? You don't want to write manual scripts to do all the work. It's just going to be impossible for you to maintain. So think about in terms of how do I help myself, not how do I hurt myself. And then for those of you who were in the, uh, how many of you were in the last keynote that, this afternoon where they talked about operators? Three, four, five. Uh, this is a really big topic. They announced, uh, Red Hat announced it at KubeCon just two weeks ago, in, uh, or a week and a half ago in, uh, in Europe. But operators are really going to be, and are currently, a big part of, of the OpenShift platform going forward. Um, the idea of operators is think about all the things that you do as a, as a human operator, and now they're programmatic, right? 
build things like lifecycle management into your platform, into the native applications that are running in Kubernetes. So the example they used in the, in the keynote was uh, Couchbase, right? If, if Couchbase, normally, if a node goes down, you have to rebalance and re-index and pull everything together and build a new node and such. But, but with the uh, operators, the operators are provided as an S, from an SDK, they're provided by the vendors, then you, you can use operators to manage a lot of these resources automatically for yourself. So definitely consider the operators that are out there and the ISVs that are using those operators, because that's going to help you as well. Um, and think in terms of, you know, installation. Well, the operators can do the installation for you. You don't have to do any of that configuration. Upgrades, that's a huge part of it. So make sure that, you know, you can utilize the upgrades. The life cycle and making sure those updates are occurring. Operators work in a, in a defined state. So it's, this is my desired state of my application. And when things change, the desired state, Kubernetes brings it right back. That's the idea, right? That's kind of how we're trying to, to work with it. And this is what the operators are essentially doing. And the SDK has just been released. Um, phase four isn't quite there yet, but then you'll be able to utilize uh, the operator to gather some metrics. You can utilize that for insights and metrics. And ultimately, kind of where we're going here is, is that automation story. So how to, how to really use that autopilot, which really fits well. This is, a, this is actually the OpenShift um, or the, you know, the OpenShift operator slide or visualization, but autopilot does fit in with my kind of airline analogy. So keep this in mind, right? We want to get to this autopilot. So how do you automate? Jurgen, can you, you think you could explain how to automate? Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks Peter. Uh, so for um, the automation, uh, Peter already talked about first, the first thing you have to have is like the APIs. Without the APIs, it's really difficult to automate. And with Automate, and once, once you, you, uh, you have your APIs in place uh, or you know how to utilize them, you can start uh, using uh, external tools like uh, Ansible. Uh, and uh, yeah, with Ansible, you, you can also um, try to, uh, to build remediation uh, with Ansible, like uh, building playbooks, runbooks that are predefined and uh, that are um, d doing basically um, a reoccurring job that is maybe rolling back or scaling up, scaling down, whatever. Uh, and you can, uh, yeah, uh, have Ansible doing this stuff for you. So how can this remediation can look, how, how can this uh, look like? So in a traditional effort, uh, what you, of course, you have to do is you have to monitor your applications because you only when certain, uh, certain thresholds are breached um, you can analyze the problem and then you can define a problem notification and send it. And you can send it to Ansible. Uh, Ansible has an API and then you can, uh, the, the event is received by Ansible uh, and then the playbook is executed. So basically, um, the critical part here is again, what Peter already mentioned is the mean time to discovery. Once you have your problem and you know what, what to do, you can just fire up the playbook you already have defined, which is in place. Uh, the critical part is you have to find where is the problem. And you can, now you have a remediation in place, but you can also automate this remediation. So what we did, uh, in, in our case, uh, it looks a little bit different because uh, we are not monitoring the applications, like looking at these applications, but we have our product in place. So we have a full stack observability, full stack monitoring. Uh, from the uh, infrastructure all the way back uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the end users. So uh, we automatically then detect anomalies. Uh, we have uh, automatic baselining in place and we can, or the product does it for us. So um, the, if, if something is not behaving as it should, um, it, it automatically searches for the root cause. So it, it creates a problem and searches for the root cause. And then this problem notification along with the root cause can be sent over to an automation platform. For example, in this case, Ansible. And then again, uh, the whole pipeline is triggered. So the event is received, the job is triggered, and uh, the playbook, the predefined playbook exactly for this problem is then executed and the problem is remediated. So for example, uh, if we take a look at a normal uh, delivery pipeline, we have a staging, we approve the staging, and now we are in production, Maybe we also run some tests in production and everything is up and running. 
So now we are deploying a new version. And in the new version, again, we push it into state, we have it in staging, we uh, run some tests on it, we approve the tests, we push the um, app application into production. Again, we run some tests on it and we approve it. But somehow we could not kind of, uh, we, we could not find out that there was a problem in the application. And the problem is only shown uh, when it's in production and maybe only in a specific region, uh, maybe only for specific users. We don't know, but the problem is, the problem, it, the issue is the problem arises and we have to take care of this. And exactly as Peter said, if the problem is at maybe Saturday night, you're having dinner, um, you want to have ways to articulate to do something. And with this auto remediation in place, you could maybe go back automatically to your previous version. And because you have known the previous version was running well, so for the time being, you just roll back to the previous version and you can take a look at the problem at a later point in time. So this is the, the story if you have everything, you have your predefined playbooks, you can, you can do your auto-remediation. But self-healing is really using the AI for automated decisions based on analyzing the data that is coming in. So using uh, AI guarantees the av availability and improves performance. Um, AI is really on top of the auto remediation since with AI you're not looking for what the, the right ways to do in your predefined playbooks. You're not matching them with the problems, but instead um, the AI is automatically searching for the right remediation for your problems. So if we take a look and we just combine what, what uh, I've just said in the last uh, few minutes. So at the, at the very bottom, you have to have automation in place. You need your predefined actions to execute. If it's Ansible playbooks, if it's your shell scripts, whatever, you need to have some automation in place. On top of this automation, you can then build your auto remediation. You are connecting monitoring, monitoring tools of your choice, with automation tools of your choice and you have to connect them to match problems to your existing scripts and playbooks. So you can run uh, these auto remediation tasks. For example, with Ansible Tower, but there is also other also open source um, products available. And on top of this, there is also then self-healing. So self-healing is really bringing all the data uh, your you're having and the platform gives, gives to you, you're having the data and you're analyzing this data. And with this data, uh, the AI is automatically looking for resolving all these problems. Okay, giving back to Peter. So, okay, so why do we talk a little bit about AI here? So there's a lot of talk. I mean, there, you know, the IBM has Watson and and uh, there's the, you know, AWS has their own version and Google has TensorFlow and such. So there's a lot of different types of AI out there. Um, how you use that artificial intelligence is really going to drive how you are able to kind of grow with these platforms because they're very complex. They're providing incredible amounts of information. A lot of it is happening at, at real, real time. So the ability for the average human to figure a lot of this out is going to be incredibly challenging. So let me give you an example. I borrowed this slide actually from, uh, from a really good friend of ours. <laughs> um, but it, it's, uh, it's pretty cool because if you look at that, you know, what, what does that mean to you guys? Anybody? Anybody want to take a guess? Does this mean anything to any of you? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does. It's just like it's a lot of dots, right? Like, I don't, it doesn't mean anything. But to a computer, this is what it looks like. Right? To a computer, instantly it tells you, oh, there's 144 pink dots. Right? Now you have actionable information. Right? You have something that, from a human perspective, you can do something with this. And then if you imagine that now you built the intelligence into your system to say, when you see this and you can do something with these numbers, do this other thing, that's really what we're talking about in AI. Right? We want you to be able to, to kind of extract yourself out so that you can provide better value working on more important things 
than trying to troubleshoot problems that exist in the environment that you, that you may never find, right? Let the computer, let the AI find the problems. Let it do the work for you and remediate those things so that your platform continues to run while you work on enhancements and the next big thing that you, you know, the next big project that your you know, management threw over the fence or your CIO saw on a, on a slide somewhere. So, uh, so we jump back to this slide uh, about the evolution of microservices. And I'm just for posterity, I'm just going to jump into this really quick. Um, one of the things that's really important, as we talked about, that complexity shouldn't scare you as an operator. Because as it gets more complex for you, you have to realize these platforms are providing a lot more functionality in there. And things like tracing, uh, monitoring, various components of the environment are are providing you the ability to actually have that observability that you want in these platforms. And, it, and it's automating a lot of that for you as well. And in the end, really, things like monitoring should just be part of your platform, right? If you think about it, the, it's a requirement. Tracing is a requirement now. Open Census, Open Tracing, Dynatrace, for that matter, right? Those, those pieces, sh you have to manage them. They're going to be part of your toolkit. And as an operator, um, you know, it's important. They should just be part of the platform offered as a service to the application developers now, instead of them building it into their applications. It's kind of silly. So, uh, so a quick recap. You bought an airplane, so I want you to observe that platform from as many approaches as you can. Right? You're going to see problems. You're going to experience that turbulence. So keep the seatbelt buckled. Focus on getting that actionable information so you can solve these problems quickly. Right? Make sure you're prioritizing what you need to work on. Right? Make sure that those passengers are happy, the customers of your, the consumers of your platform. Right? You want to keep that thing up in the air. You want to keep it flying because, I don't know, you know, if your plane is at the gate, you're not making any money. It's just costing you money. So don't keep a heater in your data center. Make sure that thing is actually providing value. What's on the radar? Keep an eye out ahead, right? Not just, hey, I'm looking for problems, but what, what optimizations can I do? How do you see those? Can you, can you steer around them? Are you able to find ways to uh, avoid downtime, right? Avoid problems ahead of time. These are, these are all 101, but this is what is, this is day two. Day two is never sexy. It's really about kind of grassroots doing the, the you know, back to basics things you need to do to run a platform. And ultimately, the leveling up, right? We can't get, you know, stuck in our old ways of, you know, oh, you know, I kind of have my own scripting mechanism and I do these things and I'm, you just it won't scale. In these types of platforms, you guys have to keep on the forefront of what's going on and how to use these. Operators are going to be a big part of that. Automation is a huge part of that. I recommend Ansible. I think it's a fantastic product. Ansible Tower is great, but there's a lot of other solutions out there. Um, and just definitely kind of keep moving forward and making yourselves a, uh, just a, a stronger operator of your platform. And ultimately, you know, the nirvana of this auto autonomous IT, right? You want to get to the point where the platform just takes care of itself when there are problems, self heals. And that will be there, right? Whether it's with us, whether it's with other solutions that are out there, this is the direction. Uh, even the operators themselves are going there. So I'm going to kind of introduce you to one more XKCD slide here. Um, it's day one of the summit, guys. Uh, I hope you have actually more questions than I gave you as far as answers. Um, there's a lot of information out there down in the, you know, whether it's the vendors or in the other sessions you're going to go to, but make sure you're asking the right questions. Like, if you're looking at vendors, ask them, are they doing operators? Are they looking, how are they going to increase your ability to see into the platform and to the problems that you're going to have to resolve, right? So I really want you guys to go out there and ask a lot of questions, right? And, um, you know, if you're shy, just say hello, right? Just drop by and say hello. We're, we're actually, we have a booth down there as well, so you're welcome to come by and talk to us. We'll talk about what we do. Um, you're welcome to compare us to anybody else that's out there. And uh, I, I believe we're going to make these slides available. Um, if we do, 
I have a bunch of links on this uh, that I can provide out to you guys as part of this deck, um, which will include, you know, talk about some of the other things that, uh, that I talked about in the day, or I didn't talk about in day one and day zero. But uh, definitely some cool things that are out there, like OpenWhisk or Project Rift. Those are cool if you want to introduce uh, serverless functions inside of your Kubernetes platform. Um, I highly recommend the Pure Performance podcast and the PodCTL podcast from Brian Gracely. Uh, both of those, the Pure Performance is, uh, is from uh, a group within Dynatrace. It's really excellent in going over all the different types of technologies that are out there, and we're not, very, we're not Dynatrace specific in it. And the PodCTL is very Kubernetes focused, and it's a group uh, out of the Red Hat teams. So it's a, it, those are great podcasts if you have a chance. And uh, on behalf of Jurgen and myself, uh, I appreciate your time today. And we're definitely here to answer a few questions if you have any. Anybody? Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.